Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues, uh, friends, partners, distinguished guests. It's my pleasure to, to welcome you all today to this regional conference on accelerating gender equality in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, short STEM in Europe and Central Asia. As I'm sure we will see highlighted in the course of this event, achieving gender equality in STEM is a complex issue that requires systemic change and that needs to involve teachers, employers, role models, policymakers, and other stakeholders alike. To create solutions which meet the needs of all, we need to understand how these diverse actors relate to each other in the STEM ecosystem. UNDP is committed to convening different stakeholders in very, very fora to help ensure that all voices are heard and to help moving this important agenda forward. This regional dialogue has grown out of advocacy and learning initiatives launched by the Accelerator Labs in the UNDP country offices in the Kyrgyz Republic, in Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and Belarus, as well as our regional online STEM for All platform launched in March this year to promote gender equality in STEM. We envision today's event as a start of a continuing dialogue connecting our offices and partners throughout the region. Today, we will hear from a range of stakeholders, from grassroots to system leaders, from the global, regional, country, and local levels about what they see as good and proven practices and avenues to increase girls' and women's representation in STEM. We encourage you all to be active participants in this event, and please put down your questions, reactions, ideas in the chat box so that we can feed them into the discussions and work together in how we transform ideas into action. You're also invited to inspire others by sharing your own STEM journey in a storytelling campaign on the STEM for All platform online after this conference. I'd like to express appreciation and thanks to the co-organizers of this event, to our colleagues in UNDP Kyrgyzstan, UNDP Azerbaijan, UNDP Kazakhstan, the Accelerator Labs, and UNDP's regional agenda team working out of Istanbul. For this opening session, we are honored to have three eminent speakers with us whom I would like to briefly introduce to you. First, Ms. Asel Kennenbeber, Deputy Minister for Digital Development in the Kyrgyz Republic, has kindly agreed to deliver the opening remarks for this conference. The opening remarks will then be followed by two keynote interventions by Ms. Mejana Spoljaric Egger, United Nations Assistant Secretary General and Director of UNDP's Regional Bureau for, for Europe and Central Asia, and by Professor Yulia Lee, Harvard University. But first, it's my pleasure to give the floor to the Deputy Minister for Digital Development, Ms. Asel Kennenbeber, to open the conference. Deputy Minister, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to join us today. The floor is yours. Добрый день, уважаемый господин Герт Трогиман, уважаемая госпожа Луис Чемберлейн, участники конференции, организаторы. Прежде всего, позвольте поблагодарить за организацию приглашения на столь важное мероприятие, которое является уникальной площадкой для обсуждения роли женщин и девочек в сфере STEM и использования преимуществ информационно-коммуникационных технологий для продвижения гендерного равенства. Всем нам известно, что высокообразованное технологическое прогрессивное население – в том числе женщины и девочки, рассматриваются в качестве основы общественного развития и построения конкурентного преимущества страны. На сегодняшний день весьма важно эффективно использовать новые навыки для женщин и девочек, чтобы обеспечить их равное участие в цифровой экономике. И необходимо отметить, что раз, развитие э, цифровых навыков у женщин и девочек в эру информационных технологий, технологий является важной составляющей экономического роста страны, создание новых рабочих мест, решение социальных проблем, а также увеличение вовлеченности женщин и девочек и повышение их активности в данной сфере. Принимая во внимание значимость сегодняшней повестки в улучшении гендерного равенства в сфере STEM, необходимо рассматривать системный подход к решению данного вопроса, а именно предпринимать следующие шаги. Учитывать уровень развития цифровой инфра инфраструктуры, развитие цифровых платформ, улучшать их и на, на национальном, и на региональном уровне, внедрять цифровое образование и развитие цифровых навыков женщин и девушек на всех уровнях системы образования. Развивать STEM образования, широкомасштабно готовить высококлассных IT-специалистов для IT-индустрии, развивать национальный цифровой контент на местных языках для обхвата всех женщин и девушек всей сельской местности, 
Наряду с этим хотелось бы отметить и обратить внимание на необходимость обеспечения учета вопросов гендерного равенства в рамках деятельности достижения целей устойчивого развития, а также в национальных и секторальных стратегиях и планах развития. Немаловажным также является реализация таких мер, как введение гендерных квот, обучение навыкам лидерства, политика позитивных действий и кампаний по повышению осведомленности общественности в целях увеличения числа женщин на руководящих должностях и в процессе принятия решения на всех уровнях. Кроме этого, хочу подчеркнуть важность взаимодействия с компаниями ИКТ частного сектора для облегчения предоставления доступа к интернету, особенно для женщин, из бедных домохозяйств и сельской местности. И, конечно, все это должно сопровождаться интенсивной кампанией по повышению осведомленности для устранения существующих гендерных стереотипов в отрасли информационно-коммуникационных технологий. Завершая свое выступление, хотелось бы обратить внимание на то, что гендерное равенство и расширение прав и возможностей женщин является необходимыми предпосылками экономического роста и инклюзивного, равноправного и устойчивого развития. Надеюсь, в рамках сегодняшнего мероприятия, где собрались высококвалифицированные эксперты, практики, представители академических кругов, мы сможем рассмотреть основные вызовы в данном направлении, выработать практические рекомендации по продвижению гендерного равенства в STEM. Выражаю надежду на то, что данная конференция будет способствовать созданию региональных сетей знаний для обмена передовыми гендерно-чувствительными практиками, для расширения доступа женщин к информационно-коммуникационным технологиям и увеличение их возможностей в сфере занятости, связанной с индустрией STEM. Спасибо большое за внимание. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister. Thank you for outlining the complexity and importance of the topic, but also for, for highlighting the important fact that this is not just about individual advancement, it's about competitiveness of societies at large um, going forward. I think this is a very very important point for us to, to bear in mind as well. Let me now, colleagues, turn to our keynote speakers. Mayana, thank you for making time um, to join us today. We all know that gender equality and particularly gender equality in STEM has been a central topic for you from the very beginning of your assignment with UNDP as director of the Regional Bureau for Europe and Central Asia. The floor is yours, please. Thank you, Garrett. Good morning, colleagues, Deputy Minister. Good morning from New York. Uh, it's still dark outside. It's a very early morning, uh, but a great pleasure to be here. And congratulations, Garrett and Luis, to all the teams for organizing such an important event. And uh, it's an honor for me to, to be invited to open it and address it. Why, why is STEM so important? And not only to me, um, but why does this issue concern all of us? The COVID-19 pandemic has halted progress on gender equality and women's empowerment across the globe. Nowhere is this more evident than in the world of work. And as a result of job losses caused by the pandemic, women employment rate in Europe and Central Asia is projected to be almost 15% lower than that of men. And according to ILO, barely a fourth of women's jobs lost in the region will return in 2021. But throughout the COVID-19 crisis, demand for workers in STEM occupations has continued and is only expected to rise in the future. So in other words, COVID-19 has only accelerated the transition to the future of work. And the future of work is intrinsically connected with STEM fields. So as a consequence, women risk, again, of being left behind. In Europe and Central Asia, the share of women researchers in engineering technology crosses 40% only in a few countries. The number of women in computer science is particularly low compared to men. Women are only 18% of ICT specialists in the EU and just 16% of founders in the ICT tech fields in Southern Caucasus and Western CIS are women. Now, gender equality in STEM and hence in the future of work is a goal unto itself. We cannot deny half of humanity the opportunity to enter and succeed in the high growth sector that powers the green and digital transformation in COVID response. But there are also compelling economic reasons for us to strive to reach this goal. An increase in STEM employment would help reduce labor market shortages, 
In the EU, for example, closing the gender gap in STEM could lead to an additional 1.2 million jobs. The higher productivity of STEM jobs can lead to higher wages, as a study by the European Parliament has shown. And more women graduating in STEM subjects choosing careers in higher wage sectors can gradually increase their average earnings. So again, this would help us to close the gender wage gap. Unfortunately, cultural and social norms, as the Deputy Minister has mentioned as well, a lack of childcare support and inadequate parental leave policies are major barriers to women entering and progressing in careers of their choice. These obstacles are amplified manifold in STEM fields whose dominated work, men dominated workplaces and entrenched gender stereotypes present great impediments for many talented women. This is the reason why we must join forces to advance gender equality measures where they matter the most. We must remove gender stereotypes in education, raise awareness and promote STEM subjects to girls and women and offer career guidance so that women and girls no longer hesitate to study in fields that are dominated by men. And there are seemingly simple measures like promoting a less masculine image of science, which could encourage more women to enroll in STEM majors at university. And what is very important is that we begin at the tertiary level to ensure that we bring a gender lens to all upskilling and downskilling and reskilling programs all along the STEM pathway. I very much look forward to Professor Julia Lee's insights on these issues. Now, dear colleagues and participants, our regional flagship STEM for All platform launched last year is engaging with multiple partners, from practitioners to policymakers, in sharing knowledge, building coalitions, and making connections to advance gender equality. Earlier this year, the platform facilitated the Girls in Tech Central Asia event. Some of you might have uh, attended it. It brought together leaders from the tech industry and ICT role models to share experiences. It offered advice to more than 120 women in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Now, one of our goals in the platform is to profile high impact initiatives by our partners government, but also the private sector. For instance, the Engineer Girls of Turkey project is implemented by Limak Foundation with the Turkish Ministry of Family, Labor and Social Services, the Ministry of National Education and also UNDP in Turkey. It is a great model of how we can increase the employability of qualified women in engineering with scholarships, internships and mentoring and coaching support. Another example comes from Azerbaijan. UNDP has partnered there with USAID in piloting a nine month mentorship program to equip young women and girls with tools and advice to progress in STEM fields. The platform is powered by the Accelerator Labs, a UNDP learning network created in 2019 to accelerate progress towards the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Now, before I close, I want to emphasize and summarize that achieving gender equality in STEM is key, not only to women's empowerment, but to our societies and economies. This issue is so vital that it requires all our concerted actions. I'm very pleased to see UNDP Accelerator Labs connecting across countries to propel this crucial agenda forward and congratulate once again, all our colleagues for making this dialogue happen. I hope it will be the first of many learning networks catalyzed by our ACT Labs and the STEM for All platform. The world and the future of work need women's skills, perspectives, talent, and leadership, as much as those of men. So therefore, let us seize this opportunity again to move forward and towards an equal future. I very much look forward to today's discussions and Gerrit, back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Mayana. Thank you for giving, a, if you wish, a strategic bird's eye perspective, but also very interesting and illustrating examples from, from around the world. And let me also join you in congratulating the Accelerator Labs who have been the, the cornerstone of uh, us coming together today. Professor Lee, it's, it's great to have you back with us um, again, in, again in a virtual space, unfortunately. I hope one day we will also have you face to face 
in one of our events. It's good to good to have you. You are you're known as a as a strategist with extensive global academic and research experience. You've served on government and academic committees across the U.S., Europe, and Latin America, including science advisories for NASA and ESA. At Harvard, you held numerous positions, including as uh, executive director for education and research, and before that as professor for astrophysics. Your focus has shifted since towards research and education innovation programs tar targeting the sustainable development goals. It's good to have you, and we're looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Greetings, everybody from the United States uh, here in Boston. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. So I'm going to attempt to give a very broad brush overview of the leaky pipeline in the global context and offer some of my own thoughts and uh, conjectures uh, for intervention, which uh, I think many is in line with what um, the esteemed uh, assistant um, deputy minister have just spoken about. Um, so my, my background is in astrophysics and I'm a career academic. So just to give reference to the complexity that is this issue and to acknowledge the, um, the digital economy that is actually driving industry 4.0, I wanted to represent the leaky uh, pipeline in the context of a network of circuits. So to make the analogy then very much the same way that we could connect these nodes of networks, nodes to actually enhance or impede performance in very much the same way, we can actually maybe think about these nodes as space, time, or interventions that will enhance or impede um, um, a female's ability to succeed in STEM. So in 2018, the World Economic Forum uh, published this landscape report on jobs. And what it's saying is that the global economy and industry 4.0 needs increasingly STEM workers. Um, and that in fact, there's more skilled jobs and there, uh, there's more jobs and they're actually skilled workers. And unfortunately, these are typically very stereotypically male dominated field jobs. They're also jobs that require a lot more education. So there's a lot more upfront necessity in terms of investment in education to get the return. But I think the return is very key uh, in terms of prosperity for the individual, for the companies and also for nations. And just as a other note is when, when women are actually in the workforce, it's also well known that the GDP increases. Unfortunately, on the reverse, um, the declining jobs that are in, at high risk for automation are very highly represented um, by females and minorities. So the question is, how can we actually both increase STEM jobs, but really also increase STEM jobs um, for um, women working in that workforce? So there's a lot here, but basically the point that I wanted to make is that there are really well-known gender barriers that we're all familiar with. And I know these three key points is something I wanna to touch on in this particular talk. But one thing that pervades all of these issues is that as we go across uh, from the pre-K level all the way to the STEM workplace, things that consistently come up are stereotypes about what girl versus boy roles are and the lack of appropriate female mentorship and of course, when you actually get into the professional stage, there is a uh, women face what is also known as a motherhood uh, penalty. So I wanna actually spend some time um, on the pre-K 12 um, stage. Um, I, this is really very critical for setting fundamentals. Uh, in fact, there's studies done that have shown that pre-primary is getting increasingly important for setting fundamentals uh, for success in the future. Um, so there's great need for investment in human capital uh, and there's a lot of you know, studies that have shown that education quality and student performance um, track very strongly with investment in the education itself. And STEM as a field, is particularly in the digital age, uh, requires a lot of comparatively costly investments uh, upfront. And at the most basic levels is investments in infrastructures. We take internet for granted, but in fact, in a lot of the world, um, that is not really a, a resource. And even as early, and, and the pandemic has certainly shown us that that is really key, right, to the access to education. Um, and and um, in fact, internet was seen as so important that the UN declared that it would to be a human right back in 2016. And certainly if we're talking about computation, we really also need to think about uh, access to equipment and resources as well. Um, 
So in terms of that, um, I think in terms of resources, clearly we actually need very capable STEM uh, teachers to teach and then a very good mentors and role models. One can argue that if you had good infrastructure and access in place, that you can leverage online courses from all around the world um, that, that teach to kids and teach to adults as well. Something that's actually been quite a lot um, on my mind is that um, STEM fields require lots of critical and analytical thinking. So something that's been on my, my mind is whether or not strategy games, such as chess and others, need to actually also be uh, included in, in education. And, and just to put that out there, something that I've also been thinking about is whether music is also a useful supplement uh, for um, improving STEM skills. I mean, often math and music skills have been linked. A lot of you know, scientists are also very uh, good musicians, although that, that is debated. That said, there has been very promising brain research on music that's coming out, that has come out that shows really interesting cognitive development when, when kids actually learn music at a very early stage. The other uh, aspect I wanted to touch upon is really cultural norms and stereotypes um, at the pre-K to 12 level. I, I, for me, I think this is an absolute critical um, you know, stage uh, of education. So the OCD and PISA, uh, PISA actually did a very significant uh, study that showed that there was no significant differences in STEM abilities between boys and girls um, at the early stages. And in fact, if anything, girls who start school are more committed to studies. Um, and unfortunately, when given a choice, uh, girls are still disadvantaged. If you actually had to send a girl versus a boy to school, um, most of the time it would be the boy that is, is chosen. Uh, luckily, I was actually very pleased to see that uh, most countries are at gender parity with, uh, with respect to gender, um, with respect to gender uh, primary enrollment. So, but that's still good. Uh, so the so my conjectures for changing cultural expectations um, is is possibly controversial, but I wonder if we can actually take strategies from behavioral economics and be able to implement some kind of subtle behavior nudges to break stereotypes. So moving on to um, the tertiary university education, this is very key for skill building. Um, we're very close to parity, it's nice to see in terms of university education and even graduate school up to almost the PhD level uh, in, in, and in fields in humanities and sciences. What you will see though is unfortunately there's a huge growth underrepresentation in the fields of STEM and math, physics, engineering. And if you can see in the, in the left plot here that um, even if we're actually at parity between girls and boys, that as you get to successively higher levels of education and career, you have a, a, a precipitous drop off in terms of um, gender parity. The other conjecture I would say is that, you know, how will we go about targeting support structures to increase female teachers at the higher levels? As you can see here from this UNESCO um, Institute for Statistics study, just over a 20 year period, you'll see that the percentage of women teachers across the world and different nations is consistently um, lowered as you go to increasingly higher education levels. So at the primary to tertiary level, you have a significantly significant drop in, um, in women teachers. And yet this is, this is significant because women will want to be looking for uh, women role models. The other conjecture I have is, will something as simple as rebranding work? So in a case study that was in fact done by uh, Eindhoven several years ago, what they did was they kept their engineering degrees the same, but all they did was they actually rebranded re, um, re it. So instead of saying that the engineering course, engineering degree is very technology focused and, and, and things that, you know, terms that would normally appeal to the males, what they did was they actually uh, re, um, what they do was they actually cast it to, to be engineering as a tool to solve social problems. And in that context, what happened is that they ended up getting a significant increase in female enrollments. The other thing I wanted to mention is I think what we teach also matters a lot. Um, so with the exponential rise of AI, where uh, deep learning and machine learning is really getting to the level of mimicking how the brain actually makes decisions, this is my own assessment of where we are at 
with AI of, uh, and, and how it compares to our own uh, computational power. In terms of you know, evolving something from simple to complex, I think the machines win. Uh, I think we're very close now between, in, in terms of the innovation space with what AI can do versus what we can do. I think where we actually win out and will probably always win out is, where, is, is the invention part and how we can create from scratch. So I think this is in line with um, the World Economic Forum Future of uh, Jobs Report. Um, so employers are looking less for particular types of degrees. What they're looking at are very specific skill sets, complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, and things like that. I would add that given the rise of AI, that what we also need to really be thinking about in you know, what we're teaching is, is really ethics in terms of really how to think about all the um, automation that is happening um, and, and how do we actually use our skills to navigate really critical problems that are happening in the world. So on the left here, this is a quite complicated figure, but basically what it's showing is that across different parts of the world and for different um, fields, this is the, the women representation in these particular fields. It's very interesting and nice to see that in fact, in many of the fields, particularly medical health sciences, that we're really uh, at parity uh, and these others as well. What is also still a gross underrepresentation is, is of course the STEM field. So even if you include the, the fields at parity with um, the STEM fields, what you get overall is that globally researchers, uh, women only make up about 33%. It's nice to see that um, you know, Central Asia and some Latin American countries are in fact reaching parity. What is very, very poor is of course the engineering technology and the sciences. And then when you look at the minorities within that, it's, it's less than 6%. It's really quite bad and atrocious. Um, and in the national academies, certainly the female representation is at very, very low levels. Um, so, um, you know, and, and certainly women in academics or elsewhere, there is something known as the motherhood penalty where, um, you know, their, their women significantly drop out after that. In, in, a, in, in a study that was actually done um, some years ago by um, Harvard, what they did was they surveyed about a thousand um, women who actually left the field and asked why they left the field. And many of the answers that came up are really consistent, I think, across academics, across corporate, and that there's no advancement, too many hours, there's an issue with work-life integration, there's hostile culture, uh, sexual harassment, all this stuff. And you can see that, in fact, there's a there's a significant decline in terms of uh, female representation from entry level to, to corporate. So just uh, my oversimplified conjectures in summary is that at all stages, I think we need to really think about how we might really do get a cultural shift away from stereotypes. How do we actually bring in more uh, female role models and, and encouragement? But the, the point being that we really need to start very, very early to build up the confidence and the belief in the self-worth of girls uh, so that they can uh, success, be successful in STEM fields. Um, and, and certainly, I think it's very, very critical that we invest in education. Often that's one of the first things to be cut. And I think by the time that right, women make it in the careers, the workplace retention is, is, is very key, right? You would have actually invested so much in the early stages. We need to really think about how do you actually also support and retain women there. So just to end uh, with, um, you know, maybe a cartoon is, right, I think, you know, we, we've had females actually be assessed by, by male standards. And, you know, independent of that, my question to you is that the world is fundamentally changing. So are the metrics that have worked before work now? And so I wanna, before I end, I want to really kind of, um, you know, zoom back out into um, what, what is important. I think we have to question that it's important to study STEM, but what are we studying STEM for? How can we leverage industry 4.0? And I would say that there is critical needs in the world and in and, 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 and solving a number of these uh, SDG issues. And with that, I, I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee. And I, I don't think this was always simplified. I think this was a really interesting illustration of research evidence and how it applies to policy priorities 
um, in in this context of, of uh, STEM and, and gender equalities. Thank, thank you very much for that. And I think also you both, um, Mayana and, and yourself, alluded to the connections to the future of jobs, the future of work, um, and, and the in a way the leaky pipeline that you described in the very beginning that I just saw on paper now is very clear to me and I hope to all of us participating participating this in this event. So thank you very much, um, Professor Lee, for this. Uh, colleagues, I understand from Umutai that we have an, a few questions in the chat box that are di directed to our keynote speakers. I'd like to give the floor briefly to Umutai just to read those questions before we close this session. Umutai, please. Yeah, thank you, Bert. And um, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Umutai, and on behalf of the IRH UNDP RH gender team, we thank Gerd and Miriana and uh, Julia for opening and the brilliant keynotes uh, for our takeaway. So because we are really running out of time, we would really prefer if you could uh, type your answer in the Q&A session, if it's OK. So um, it's, it's really going hot. Um, but and now let me introduce the two next prominent speakers who will present the global and regional perspectives. And they are Mr. Stara Chkovsky, the founder of Technovation, who is currently based in US, but has an extensive experience in empowering girls in STEM globally. And the second one, Mrs. Radenka Wiffen, she is an associate professor at the University of Donia Gorica, Montenegro, Western Balkans. So thank you very much, uh, Tara and Donia. You have 10 minutes per each, and we are delighted uh, that if you introduce yourself to the audience before you start the presentation. Uh, again, uh, we are very sorry, but maybe we will not have time uh, for question and answer. Please type your questions in the Q&A box, and we will follow up on that. Thank you very much, and Tara, floor, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. Let me... Uh... To share my screen over here. So um, my name is Tara and I am the founder and CEO of Technovation. I know there are some Technovation folks in the audience, so welcome to everyone who is dedicated to empowering girls into um, STEM. And I just wanted to share um, lessons from 15 years of running this nonprofit and trying to um, to achieve gender parity in, in innovation. Uh, so we've heard plenty of evidence, um, but I just wanted to add a couple more that when you when girls are educated, it directly saves lives. Um, and um, a little known connection is that girls' education is the sixth most effective strategy for reducing carbon dioxide emissions, even ahead of solar panels and electric vehicles. Um, and um, technology, of course, is the future but less than 10% of this future has women. And that's the problem that we set out to solve 15 years ago. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the journey and what we learned through different mistakes so others can benefit from it as well and not make the same mistakes. Um, so when I started, I'm, I'm an aerospace engineer by training and I came into this mostly because I felt that um, girls were not given the same opportunity as boys um, to look at their potential. And when I was looking at the, at the research um, to see what, what makes a difference, a key piece that came out was the impact parents make on, on, on learning. And um, in the US, there's a very significant report called the Coleman Report that looked at 60,000 students across all sorts of socioeconomic statuses and um, parents came out as one of the main drivers that um, predicted student achievement. And there was a, a model uh, in a school called uh, the open classroom where I saw parents and children learning together. Um, and the kind of um, uh, learning environment that was generated when an adult uh, said, I don't know, let's find out together. Um, that kind of role modeling to me, um, there was something very interesting there. Um, and so we started a family science program, um, especially targeting minority groups, uh, low income communities. And everybody said that um, parents don't have time for this kind of engagement. Um, but the key, the key um, nugget there was to offer dinner. 
because all of us, regardless of how much money we make, we all need to eat food. And if we want, um, if we uh, basically are using that time to learn together as a family, uh, what we found was that parents love not having to clean the dishes, not having to worry about what to cook, but, and also to spend quality time with their children learning together. And so the family science model turned out to be very, very powerful. Um, and the way we connected with STEM was to actually bring STEM uh, university students as mentors. So we partnered with different universities around the country and offered them technical elective credit for learning how to take complex STEM concepts and to teach them to the families. And the families loved to interact with a completely different group. And of course, the university students loved the experience of connecting again with, a, with their local communities that they would never have normally connected with. Um, and here are some of the examples of what families said that they loved about the model. Mostly it was the bonding time, but especially for daughters, it was really powerful to see their dads and their mothers learning. Um, we got a National Science Foundation grant to look at the impact of this program. And what we found was that um, it definitely worked um, to help children increase their interest in STEM. It definitely helped parents bring in STEM as a family hobby. It was helpful for the engineering students to improve their technical communication skills. But our biggest question was, could this impact last? Um, and could this scale? And um, we were not sure that the data was showing that. In peril, we were running another program uh, where girls were challenged to tackle community issues uh, using te uh, technology. So they worked with mentors from industry. Um, and over the period of nine weeks, um, they developed apps um, to end business plans. Um, and what we found was that looking at both of these programs um, and also looking at the research, we were beginning to figure out what are some key elements of programs that drive behavior change. Um, the first was the importance, of course, and I call it the four E's to self-efficacy. Uh, the first was exposure. It's really, really important to have role models. It, they can be in the form of stories in the media or TV shows, but also mentors, um, but they need to be trained. The second is that the experience has to be like a video game. It should be very easy to get started. Uh, there should be lots of social interactions, a clear goal. Um, and we all want people to believe in us. And so if we have high expectations, we rise to these high expectations. And this is where it's not just important to have mentors, but also parents involved in this whole learning experience. And lastly, um, this is a failing that online programs actually are not able to do, which is to have the adrenaline, the drama of a lar of an in-person competition. And to we, very often we forget that we are human beings that uh, if we are hungry and sleepy and tired, we're not going to learn. And so these basic human needs need to be met um, if we are to change our long-term behaviors and expectations. And so the recipe that we were beginning to pull together based on these programs was that Dosage is really, really important for attitude change. Six hours is not enough. Somewhere more, closer to 100 hours per year is more likely to build an attitude and identity as an innovator. Um, learning has to be purpose-driven, and this is not a gender thing. Even it's more about a new learner versus an expert learner. We all want to know, what, why should I learn? Why should I care? Um, and for scale, you need to make it uh, relevant to local communities. And we learned through Technovation was that finding a problem in your community makes it immediately locally relevant rather than saying, go through this course and you're going to learn about nanotechnology that may not be that interesting to someone. Um, the adults involved in the ecosystem need to be trained. And finally, uh, we learned that technologies need to be cool. Um, so there's a glamour factor in saying, ooh, I'm using AI to tackle this problem or whatever the cutting edge technology is. Um, and so that's where we are today. Uh, Technovation uh, mentors and girls use technology to tackle the, social de the sustainable development goals. We reached roughly 300,000 participants. Uh, we have a very thick network of support every year. We have roughly 100 chapter ambassadors who are volunteers. And we have some in the audience today who recruit roughly 6,000 educators and mentors who support 25,000 girls on an annual basis. Um, and here are some of the examples of the apps. You can see uh, really, really amazing uh, innovations to local problems that 
girls are bringing their innovative ideas to. Um, the one on the right is about monitoring forest fires in Cambodia. Um, the one on the bottom left is about helping fa uh, farmers not burn straw uh, so that they're not co uh, contributing to air pollution. Um, and the statistic that we are most proud of is that 76% of our alumni are now pursuing STEM degrees. They're working in STEM careers and they credit Technovation for giving them their entrepreneurial and their, you know, you know, and their spark for innovation. Um, what I want to emphasize is that what's working is that it's not just learning how to code. That is just one part of it. The really important part is learning how to solve real world problems, uh, identify human behavior barriers, work in a team, and most importantly, learn about yourself. What motivates you? Uh, what drives you? When do you get frustrated? And overall, begin to understand how to solve really complex problems that the ones that we face in the world today. And so for the coming season, we are excited to partner with the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs to use AI and space data to tackle the sustainable development goals. Um, and we have three age divisions bringing our lessons from 15 years together. The beginner division where eight to 12 year old girls will be supported by their parents who will be their mentors. The junior and senior division supported by mentors from industry and a very strong pillar of support for our alumna. Um, and, and that is it. I will share my uh, slides in the chat so that everyone has access to this. But thank you so much uh, for inviting me to share our lessons from the 15 years. Okay, many thanks, Tara. It was, it was very, uh, very interesting on, uh, on STEM work with parents and kids, the focus on behavior change importance on learning about yourself, you know, to actually answer the complex pro problems and not just about coding. So uh, thank you very much. And I invite um, Mrs. Radenka uh, Wiffen to uh, speak the next. Um, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here today. I will share my screen now. Okay. So I'm going to be talking from uh, Western Balkans perspective, which means from the perspective of uh, uh, Southeast European countries that have ambitions uh, to join the EU, but which are not members yet. I'm from uh, Montenegro, but I studied and work abroad uh, for the last 20 years, and I only came back uh, home last year. Um, I work in the field of uh, material science and applied physics, and I have uh, research experience from both inside the EU and uh, the Western Balkan. So for me, it's not difficult to spot uh, that researchers from the Western Balkan countries have a very different experience uh, of gender equality in academic and research settings than you might find in uh, Western Europe. So for the basic information in this presentation, I uh, mainly use the two publications that you can see on the slide prepared by the um, Regional uh, Cooperation uh, uh, Council and the UNDP. Um, they provide um, a really good uh, clear overview of the situation in the region and uh, highlight all the points that you can see uh, here. So overall, they prove that the leaky pipeline is present in our region as well. So let's start with the statistics. If we look at the general gender statistic regionally or by country, it's about 50-50 for uh, STEM graduates. And um, for example, female graduates are double that of men in MAT in all our countries, or in some cases also in some natural scientists, sciences. Uh, so however, as uh, the data from Serbia here show, uh, there is clear segregation, for example, in engineering or uh, technology. So there is gap in engineering uh, graduates. Uh, but uh, what we don't see here, well, these numbers don't show what happens next. How many women work in STEM fields after their degrees? Do they leave to become a stay-at-home mom or they are all just primary or secondary school teachers in math, physics or biology? Often we don't have data to be able to answer. 
So we have seen that at degree level, there is a gender balance in at least some STEM fields and also among researchers. So we can see here the data are very, the, very good. In North Macedonia, almost 50% of the researchers uh, are female researchers in STEM fields. That is higher than the EU average, that is 33.1%. And in all countries uh, of the Western Balkan, this is the case. So it's about 40 to, to 50%. Uh, but uh, what about in academic management position? Most of the gender structure of academic management in the Western Balkan is not known. There is no data, but the information from Albania is probably indicative of how it works everywhere. So here you can see in this uh, table um, that up to the level of deputy dean, there is gender parity. But once we get to the dean of the faculty or director of the university, then we find that in almost every case, men are in these positions. And, uh, and uh, um, that means they are making the financing and hiring decision, decision on research direction and so on. It's a very male dominated uh, world. So where does this leaking come from and how can we change it? Let's, let's look at some specific regional examples of the barriers that women face and what causes them. So these are photos of Montenegrin women and families from the 19th century. Now throughout history, women in Montenegro have been first a daughter, then a wife, then a mother. And this is a deep mindset that has been how we view things for centuries. The most important and the only possible thing was the family, honor and the children, especially male children. And things have changed a bit, but to be honest, not much. Montenegro is still largely perceived as a society where men make decisions and women fit in with that. So these photos of modern women very much show how there are roles in work or society for women, but only certain ones. A woman in office is okay, a woman engineer is not. When I started uh, as an electrical engineer in my first job about 25 years ago, my male boss openly laughed at me and said, nobody needs a female engineer. So I decided to quit and went abroad. Of course, what Montenegro society really seems to want from its women is shown in the third photo, uh, because your best possible project is to be a mother. Just as a quick example, we have three universities here. There has been one female rector and she was sacked after her first term in office. So this attitude that women should know their place isn't the only obstacle. There, there was a case which shook the region this summer, that of the Patents and Science Center. This is a very important institution in Serbia dealing with the development of scientific culture, scientific literacy, education and science promotion. Their activities are mostly focused on young people, pupils and students, as well as on teacher training. And they have a very good record of promoting STEM, including to girls. However, in June, a news story broke about allegations of sexual misconduct and harassment in the center going back years. It's still an ongoing case and hasn't been proved either way. But let's just say that if it did turn out to be true, it wouldn't be surprising because low level gender bias and sexism is pretty common in a lot of research institutions across the region. So there is that element of gender inequality to consider as well. There are also wider issues of academic integrity that go beyond gender, but which act as barriers to STEM careers in research. One more example, this time from Albania, but to be honest, there are issues everywhere in the region. Plagiarism is a big issue for academia in general at all levels in the Western Balkans. And it gets highlighted when, as was the case in Albania, several high level political figures were awarded PhDs on the basis of what we might call doubtful theses or research papers. There's also a case in court right now in Montenegro where a university law professor is accused of plagiarizing her own student's work and publishing it, publishing it without acknowledging him as co-author. While that's not specifically a gender issue, it shows the attitudes towards things like academic ethics that are common in every country in the region and which contribute to people leaving academia or leaving the region to work abroad. So we know what the problems are. What can we do to support gender balance and gender equality in STEM? Well, let's look at one example of institutional support and one example of something more like a grassroots initiative. First, the institutional approach. 
We have gender equality plans that are being introduced in the Western Balkans, and this is a response to changes in the requirements of Horizon Europe, where from 2022, every applicant for EU funding must have a gap. So it's being driven by the EU from the outside, but it also forces institutes and universities to address gender equality in a specific way. There are lots of tools to support gap development and implementation, and the one recommended by the EU is the GEAR tool, which is a product of best practices taken from projects or gender inclusion and equality that have been funded from Horizon 2020 and FP7, the previous two European funding uh, frameworks. So that's all positive, but of course, it has to be more than just a plan on a piece of paper. It has to be implemented and led to change uh, on the ground too. So here we can see the mandatory requirements of the gap, things like everything being approved by the top management and document being publicly available and incorporated into staff training. So now one thing that is a potential worry uh, in the Western Balkan is that it will just be a document on a shelf that is written to tick the box, but not used or taken seriously. So we have to be very aware of monitoring how and when gaps are implemented. And so now what we might call bottom-up approach uh, to gender equality in STEM. This is the regional network of women in STEM for the Western Balkans, launched this year by the RCC and the UNDP. Uh, we want to build a strong community of all researchers that support gender equality in STEM in the Western Balkans. The aims here are to bring together women in STEM careers in academia, industry, and business, to promote the value of women working in STEM fields, and also to act as positive role models for girls and young women including providing mentoring and training on how to progress in a STEM career. So we need more women with more influence because that is how we change the culture and the mindset. Our next planning meeting is actually next week here in Montenegro, and we will be looking to identify opportunities to expand the network across the Western Balkans, find areas for us to get involved in and advocate for gender equality and work out what our strategy is for raising awareness, building capacity and supporting career opportunities and study opportunities for women in STEM across the region. It's early days, but we are hopeful that this will have a real impact on developing ways to change the culture and change the conversation around STEM subjects. So some quick takeaway uh, points from the Western Balkan perspective, uh, real change can only come if we change our expectations of others and of ourselves. So first, better monitoring of real world gender equality is needed. This is the idea that we are not just interested in statistics, but also in real life experience. And in that, we need to look at what really happens and who makes the decisions. Then we need to highlight examples of positive structural change. We need to look at where, how, and why that happens, and what we can learn about what helps create this structural deep level change in perceptions and attitudes to women in STEM in patriarchal societies like those of the Western Balkans. And finally, we need to look at the regional and international picture and try to adapt and share best practices. The gender equality plan is a good start, but we need to push universities and research institutes to properly implement things. The other thing is more and better networking, for example, the Western Balkan network, whereby sharing experiences and promoting success stories, we can change more than just the surface numbers. It's going to take time, but we will definitely get there. So thank you very much. I will be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Mrs. Vadenka. And it was um, a very interesting and profound exam original example that you have given. This daughter, wife, and the mother concept is actually very common in many countries, not only in Montenegro. And actually, thank you very much for highlighting such a new practice as harassment in research institutions that prevent women from going forward. But also, we, will, we are very thankful for you that you are giving this hands-on developments that you are dealing with, the training, the plans, networking, the changing cultures. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the both speakers. And I'm, um, I'm just, I just want to point out that we are re really running of time and we have questions in the Q&A box. Some of the questions for some reason went to answer. But if you look at them, we would really much appreciate if you could answer them right in the chat box uh, for the participants. Thank you very much. And I will gradually switch to Tiffany. 
Tiffany, the floor is, the floor is yours. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Matai. And many thanks again to Tara Ochowski and Rodenka Wiffen for their insights on the leaky pipeline and sharing best practices for advancing girls and women in STEM that goes just beyond giving access to internet and computers um, or having great strategies and intentions on paper. You gave some really great examples of the power of behavioral insights, family engagement, mentorship, role models, institutional support, and for training STEM is relevant. Um, so I'm Tiffany Sprague. I'm delighted to be here with UNDP STEM for All Digital Platform Initiative. Um, as you heard earlier, we launched this digital space to raise public awareness of the gender barriers to girls and women's advancement in STEM in Europe and Central Asia, and to show how much more we all prosper when women participate in STEM. So STEM for All serves as a public space that aims to transcend the borders within the STEM ecosystem, so we can all come together to share knowledge among our fellow teachers, businesses, policymakers, development practitioners, girls, women, families, so we can all co-create actions to move the needle on gender equality in STEM, such as the initiatives you heard about earlier, like mentorship programs, scholarships, investments in skilling and upskilling. This platform will give visibility to the gender champions and women who are breaking down barriers, profiling their stories and efforts in the form of videos, blog posts, and our podcast, our new one called Chats with Steminists. If you haven't listened to it, give it a, give it a whirl. Um, and today we're so incredibly lucky to have three of these gender equality advocates with us for this session to share their stories and to hear their reactions and insights from the grassroots perspective. As the grassroots, they're the critical drivers of social change. So I would like to invite Kuzhebek Batrakonova from Kyrgyzstan, Maral Gurbanzada from Azerbaijan, and Nadia Babinska from Ukraine. So the next 14 minutes or so, this will be a casual roundtable discussion, starting with asking each of our guests to introduce themselves, their current role, and their brief description of how they've addressed gender barriers to get to where they are today. So Kuzhebek, you wanna start, kick us off? Yeah, thank you very much, Tiffany. And thank you very much uh, for attending this conference today. My name is Kuzhebek Patrkanova. I'm the program director of Kyrgyz Space Program. Uh, this is an initiative where an all-female team is building the first uh, satellite of Kyrgyzstan. And uh, we are also, we are lucky to host some basic engineering courses for our girls and women in our uh, country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maral? Hi, uh, my name is Maral Gurbanzada. I am... Um, a researcher in artificial intelligence and human robot interaction. I started my journey with um, supporting women's political participation around 10, ago, 10 years ago with NDI. And then I worked on various CSR initiatives to uh, also support the women in STEM particularly. Uh, in the, during the pandemic, I've held around 30 free webinars on uh, scientific thinking, uh, teaching the scientific uh, mindset and scientific thinking to um, Azer Azerbaijani women. And uh, currently I am a mentor at um, UNDP uh, Azerbaijan Women in STEM program. Thank you. Thank you. Nadia, please. Hello, my name is Nadia. I'm from Ukraine. I am a founder and coordinator of one of the biggest open data communities in Ukraine. And I also used to be the first, one of the first uh, people, uh, women who launched Technovation. So I'm very glad to see here Tara, Technovation in Ukraine. Uh, it's like uh, all my work regarding um, uh, uh, empowering and helping girls to go to IT is volunteering uh, and I have something to share with you and we'll be glad and I'm very thankful for all our 125 uh, attendees and I will ask them to write maybe uh, one word that describes a STEM for girls. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll start with um, Kuzhebek again. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this leaky pipeline phenomenon. It'd be interesting to hear about your own lived experiences to this end, especially with respect to the cultural norms and stereotypes that are obstacles. Since you are um, a STEM professional yourself and an advocate in the field, um, yeah, can you share some of your actual experiences with this? 
Yeah, thank you very much. It's a great question, I guess, uh, because this is what motivates me to work uh, daily. Uh, and I didn't know this term before I think I knew about the conference, but I knew about this phenomenon because we in our program also focus on um, the girls dropping out from STEM uh, as they get to university or <clears throat> as they embark on their careers, unfortunately. Uh, in my childhood, I would say that girls uh, were never encouraged to be engineers or to uh, become STEM educators or to have STEM career. And once uh, when I uh, told my dad that I would like to be an engineer, I think I was around 12 years old, my father said that, well, you know, probably it's not the best option for you because our labor market is not prepared enough uh, to have engineers, uh, wouldn't have enough jobs uh, and so on and so forth. And therefore I was uh, a little bit discouraged from taking the STEM path uh, from the beginning, I would say. And of course, uh, there is also a little bit, I think, amount of pressure from our educators as well, because uh, sometimes the girls and my colleagues who are also uh, who also work with me in our space program, uh, they heard uh, some discouraging opinions from their teachers or university professors saying that uh, it's not very important for girls to learn physics or mathematics because anyway, probably you are going to get married. So it's not uh, your top priority in life. And there is uh, this kind of discouragement, uh, which I, I guess needs to be uh, cared, uh, taken care of by us, of course. And of course, I do agree with the, the role models uh, and their importance in our life. Because uh, again, in my generation, role models were in something, especially in STEM, um, something very common. Uh, and therefore, I guess my generation struggled a little bit because we didn't know that we could become engineers. And I'm really glad that nowadays this has become a very actual topic and that we are discussing it uh, during our conference here as well. And the number of role models in our country uh, in STEM are growing. And I think this is uh, a great start for us. That's right. I just I had a follow up question. So what what got you through all the, the stereotypes and all the discouragement? How did you overcome those, you personally? Well, I guess uh, my friends and my mother, uh, they really supported me. And my mother uh, used to live in South Korea. And after uh, having lived there, she told me that, you know, that uh, Software engineering is a very good uh, specialization as well. And you could uh, probably uh, go and study it. And I thought, wow, if my mother thinks that I'm capable of doing that, well, probably I think <laughs> I should uh, probably um, think about that carefully. And of course, uh, I was a little bit scared at the time and I did not go uh, to study software engineering at the very beginning. Uh, and I regret about that a little bit. But uh, at my university, we had to study programming as part of the data analytics classes. And after that, when I was exposed to programming, I understood that it's not very difficult to do so. And after university, I became even more encouraged uh, to be part of STEM. Right, thank you. So encouragement is really key. Um, to this end. So I kind of wanted to, to switch gears here with Morale and to see if she had any, do you have, did you have any, any reactions to the recommendations made by our speakers so far? Um, is there any one aspect from any of the speakers prior to this that really resonated with you? Uh, well, I generally think that um, these, uh, I, I call this boys club testing, like, um, once you get into the tech field, you realize that it's a boys club and then you get tested by them. Um, like, are you just a pretty face or are you actually smart? So that happens constantly. And there, uh, as the speakers actually, well, it, it was mentioned in a bit different terms, but um, it, it completely resonated with me because um, it is um, pervasive. It is so everywhere. It is not only Azerbaijan and Kyrgyzstan. I completely, uh, re what Kuzibek just said is um, absolutely what I also felt being discouraged from going after um, 
science, physical science, um, sciences uh, as a girl, because you will have to sacrifice a lot in order to stay in that field. And um, from, I, I, I mean, I think there are three issues uh, here. I mean, it's part of one issue, but it all starts with the boys club um, testing, basically, with the rejection of um, the idea that a female can be just as smart as a man and constant testing of, are you smart enough or aren't you smart enough? And if you are smart enough, then the second phase is usually you have to make feminine sacrifices, which means that you have to choose either motherhood or uh, professional success, or um, basically you need to pretend to be more masculine than you actually are in order to fit in. Um, and um, the agreeable, more agreeable women uh, eventually get uh, pushed out and more aggressive and um, the ones that can survive in this masculine uh, environment, they stay and they basically join the boys club and sometimes also perpetuate this um, uh, rejection of femininity in uh, female, in pe people in uh, basically females. So, for instance, I've always, uh, I, I always tell that to our, uh, our mentees and just as a, uh, advice, like a good advice to other girls is that uh, before, um, so basically it, it's not always a good idea to be agreeable. Um, assertiveness training is very important and I think everyone uh, from who enters the tech field needs to learn how to act assertively and how to um, show uh, the you know the people the representatives of, of this boy club that um, you are not going to give in your feminine um, side in order to fit in so um, basically teach and show that a feminine and uh, female style of working uh, is here to stay and um, promote it as much as I can. And of course that is uh, accomplished by uh, making sure that there are actually females that are working in a female style. So that motherhood can be a part of uh, um, your life, not something that you have to uh, run from in order to have professional success. That's what I think. Certainly, thank you. Oh, yeah, it's just changing the the standard because right now it seems like we're the men's standard and the, their lifestyle is kind of setting the the pace, and we're kind of expected to adjust adjust to that. So, yeah, thank you for your actions. I, I wanted to now move on to Nadia, and since we are here amongst different stakeholders. Um, and we have these cross, being able to cross sector um, conversations here. Um, I wanted to ask, what do you think needs to be prioritized to move beyond dialogue to actively dismantling this systemic and social barriers to women's advancement in STEM careers? I mean, where should we focus our efforts? We, you know, we're talking about coming out of our silos and, and talking to one another and really working together. What, what can we really do to align the needs of girls and women and teachers and employers and policymakers and really move beyond dialogue to, to action. Thank you very much, Tiffany. Yeah. And I'm very glad to hear, to, to read here such kind of very empowering words for women in STEM, such as motivation, challenge, courage, complexity, change. So we can motivate, we can encourage change, we can show that this complexity is not something undoable and unsolvable. And we can be like, I mean, we as a civil society or people, just uh, parents or friends, we can support each other and we can support those who, who wants to be in STEM, who wants to try themselves. And if we want to see how we can, um, what, can we do? Uh, uh, first of all, we have to look at uh, where these uh, stereotypes and these barriers are formed. For example, if we start from school, yes, when teachers said, like, uh, say, uh, say, like, this girl should knit, for example, or should draw, uh, and this guy should uh, code. So it's like, it's about the education of teachers, education of those who 
gives knowledge and who has the uh, authority, uh, some kind of authority uh, for for girls and for boys as well, uh, and uh, and also create the space in schools, in kindergartens, in uh, higher uh, educational institutions, create the space when women can. Uh, show themselves and they can be themselves and can choose what they want they are not framed and this is about the general policy of gender equality um, uh, on the state and local level so it's a huge problem that and huge challenge that should be um should be somehow taken by our governments regarding uh, civil society and i'm uh, as we are have here a lot of uh, donor representatives it's about the long-term project because for example Technovation, as we implemented it in Ukraine, we started it by our own, use, uh, using our resources, using our time and uh, um, pro bono working day and night on helping uh, this, uh, school uh, girls to enter into IT entrepreneurship. But you understand that it's not uh, sustainable and you will drop out uh, kids will drop out, uh, mentors will drop out because it needs to be supported uh, and in long term perspective as well. Because uh, after, so okay, we had this challenge. After this challenge, kids they okay, I I tried myself. Maybe I won, uh, I win, maybe not, and I forgot about that. Now we have to support those who sh who shows interest to uh, to IT, for example, or to other STEM uh, STEM STEM disciplines. So we have to have these okay we have probably we will have someday these uh, state support but we have also um somehow to support it from the civil society side and uh, and another uh, side is business so it's about social social responsibility awareness of business that we have to support uh, uh, gender equality we have to support women in stem we have to support some uh, labs some challenges some programs for for girls in stem and we have to create for them this space to to try because maybe maybe girl will not like stem but she has to have this option to try to try without any any judgments and for me the main challenge was during uh, for example technovation uh, project implementation to explain the society why we need these uh, girls program only for girls program why do we need to encourage to help to assist to support women in their journey and only women why have we uh, how why should we create this safe space for them to uh, unleash they 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 force and they will to be in stem and it's very hard to explain it so maybe some kind of uh, uh, also popularization, some kind of campaign, information campaign can help to, uh, you know, to share this knowledge that, okay, uh, th this is the, uh, this is very important for girls to be in this safe space and to, um, to develop these skills and to, uh, to make themselves, themselves uh, not scary in doing some things. And also another thing that I, uh, I'm sure that should be done is that, you um, uh, nevertheless, women are in STEM or not, there should be a high, high level of non tolerance of any sexist jokes, any sexism from younger age till, I know, like uh, mm -hmm. older age, but no sexism. Without this sexism, uh, you know, like uh, uh, surrounding, I, I hope it will somehow change the mindset and it will lead to um, other cultural changes and institutional uh, institutional as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nadia. Well, I wish I had more time <laughs> to talk to you all three. Um, this opportunity to speak with you today has really been an honor. Um, we've heard a lot of, uh, it's so good to hear the voices on the ground, so to speak, um, and to see the lived experiences of the women in STEM and those that are promoting gender equality. Um, across the region. So thank you uh, very much. I, I hope that this is just the beginning of our conversation online uh, and offline. I will definitely put the STEM for a website in the chat for all of you, um, because I know what we've heard today is like really sharing um, our experiences and giving visibility to, to, to all the good things that are happening. That's, it's, that's part of it. It's, it's half, the, half the solution is knowledge is power. So, um, and do get in touch with us. So, and 
On the STEM for All website link, there's a place where you can share your own stories and insights. And we'll be launching a storytelling campaign after this so that we can continue and amplify all the, all the voices. But again, thanks to um, Kluzhebek, Maral, and Nadia for their time and showing us what is possible. Um, and yes, please put all your questions in the Q&A box and we will get to them um, offline. And now I will turn the floor over to Alexei to get into the country perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Good afternoon, evening, morning, dear participants. My name is Alexei Chistogarsky, and I'm communications analyst with UNDP country office in Belarus. And it is my pleasure to moderate the country level perspective section of this conference. First, I would like to thank the previous speakers for giving a very comprehensive and detailed overview of the global, regional, and grassroots perspectives, and to continue by inviting you to the country level experiences. Let's see how we think globally and act locally in Kyrgyzstan, Belarus, Azerbaijan, and Kazakhstan with UNTP Accelerator Lab colleagues and their partners, together presenting the country's best solutions. Uh, please keep also in mind that you can ask your questions by writing them in the Q&A box that can be found in the lower part of your Zoom screen. And of course, we'll try to answer them right after each presentation. So I open the floor to Kyrgyzstan, who is committed to applying digital transformation to empower girls and women in STEM. Jenny, the floor is all yours. You are very welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. This is greeting you all from Bishkek. I kindly invite also our uh, team members together. OK, so allow me to share my screen. So hi, audience. Um, so uh, it is a great pleasure for us uh, uh, to start this country perspective with Kyrgyzstan, a country that is inspired to become the dreamland for many uh, digital nomads. And together with our team, um, uh, my name is Jenny Jin Shkazil. I'm the head of experimentation of UNDP Accelerator Lab. Uh, we, I also had the pleasure to invite uh, Divya Singh even though she's like now in UNDP India, but uh, she joined the digital mission visit Kyrgyzstan recently uh, in, in the role of the gender expert together with our Talan Sultano. He's a co-founder and the chair uh, from Kyrgyz Internet Society. So three of us together today, we wanted to present you how from this UNDP practice or um, uh, gender policy recommendation, as well as the civil society, we are empowering the women in STEM with digital transformation. So, but before going into very like uh, in details about um, uh, STEM, in, uh, STEM women, I would like to brief uh, do uh, like a country uh, context. So uh, Kyrgyzstan is a very young uh, country with the average age of 24, and there's an increasing demand for jobs. So when the youngsters they cannot find a job inside the country, then they just look forward to uh, securing other work opportunities abroad. So that's why we have like a pretty large number of um, migrants working abroad. Approximately like 30% is their women. Uh, according to the official statistic, uh, there are like 800,000 so working migrants. Um, but informally, you know, there might be like over 1 million among any 6 million population. So that's that's quite a, like a big demand. And most of those people, they mainly occupy this kind of um, lower level um, uh, uh, jobs which, uh, which requires lower level skills. So there have been already many national initiatives. We wanted to change this narrative. For example, we have this um, uh, high technology park, uh, which has set up a very ambitious uh, mission saying like, we want to enable every Kyrgyzstani to live in Kyrgyzstan and work for the world. In 2017, uh, Kyrgyz government actually launches this uh, nationwide program is called uh, Sanarit Kyrgyzstan. Sanarit translated is like a digital Kyrgyzstan. So we wanted to uh, uh, aim to build this transparent state, which uh, is a knowledge-based economy. Sanarit Kyrgyzstan is a key component of our National uh, Sustainable Development Plan 2040. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is committed to enhancing the human capital and innovation. So according to our national policy, we highlighted like a highly educated, tech progressive population is the basis for social development and building a competitive advantages for a country. 
So what is the role of UNDP in Kyrgyzstan? We wanted to help our national partners to create this enabling environment so that we can enhance the ICT digital skills for youth, especially for young women like in a digital economy. So that they can like uh, uh, we can also help them to integrate the global labor market. So this is like a brief like a graph. I don't know if you see. I think this is a little bit sorry. <laughs> so one of our project is about the digital skills and in digital economy. So I wanted to show how we work in UNDP here. So we apply this human center approach to digitalization. We have to understand what is the true needs of our beneficiaries. And then uh, we'll, um, in order to enable this digital transformation, we have to start with uh, the digital capacity. But in order to make that happen, we understand the importance of setting up this new educational standard and curriculum. So that's why we closely uh, partner with the Ministry of Education and Science in the Kyrgyz Republic. But before going to our work, we actually want to make uh, uh, want to make this uh, needs assessment of the labor market. We first we understand what is really the need, what kind of professions are actually needed in the current labor market. Then we bring this market needs into this formal education curriculum. Together with the MOE and with our other academic partners, we already developed this national um, uh, strategy for digital development. We have submitted that one. We even experimented with the university teachers and the school teachers together, like through the Train the Teachers program, TTT. So by doing that, uh, I want to also highlight, we have an informal education. What I mean by informal, for example, we were, um, we helped like um, create these free courses as course area, like more than 4,000 uh, youngsters, they uh, registered, they learn a lot of pro digital skills. We also had like uh, over like almost 50 digital events all over. We very actively doing the information awareness campaign. You can see this is kind of role models of uh, women is here. We even made a very short film, it's called Jildis. Like the story is also about the young girl being inspired to become a digital uh, champion. So, so through this formal education and informal education, all together, we were truly to embed this human center approach to digitalization so that our beneficiaries, they can use this internship programs, entrepreneurship programs and going back to the labor market. Last but not the least, UNDP, we've been also like helping, we already launched 10 youth centers all over the Kyrgyzstan with our donors. So this is actually to build this infrastructure for them to build these communities of learning for youngsters. I would like to also the last shout out, actually very, it's a great pleasure, we're very proud to say in the beginning of this year, with the UNDP Chief Digital Office, we want this Digital X Skill Accelerator Program. Among 168 applications in 75 countries, there are, we are selected as 10 most impacted solutions. So we have a project called Balatech. Balatech it is a, a, a very interesting program like uh, teaching the kids programming using the gamifications. So through this simple way of gamification, this is actually innovation driven by our private innovator. So we were able to engage both young boys and girls to learn programming. In the last, we have already 15,000 youngsters learn um, programming through Balatech. And this year, 2021, in November, we are holding this uh, Olympiad. We target to reach 50,000 youngsters. And we hope that we can have even more girls to join this program learning about the 50 percentage. Yes, yeah, so I would like to pass the floor also to now the representative of the civil society organization. Palant, please. Thanks so much, Jenny. Let me jump right in. Uh, let me share some experiences of our work on the grassroots level. Uh, I'm representing the Kyrgyz Internet Society and some of our work involves bringing internet connectivity to very remote areas of the country. And you can see in this picture, some of these locations have no roads, no electricity, no TV. And as you can see on the left picture, it's both boys and girls who are helping do this work. Uh, the other type of work we are doing is uh, the project called Ilim Box. Not uh, all the villages in Kyrgyzstan and in Central Asia have internet connectivity, but we have a solution for this. 
we can bring the content to these schools and to these libraries with this device called Ilimbox. And uh, uh, Nadia mentioned earlier from Ukraine that the importance of safe spaces for girls, especially in rural areas. And we realize that you know, in rural areas, boys have more opportunities to hang out, to do sports, but for girls, libraries have become one of these important safe spaces and the Ilim Box can be very useful for that, uh, to bring uh, educational content to rural youth. Uh, the other, uh, and we would like, we can share the experience of the Ilim Box with, the par with partners uh, across the region. Uh, once we bring the real internet uh, to the villages and to all the locations in the country, uh, once we have the content, uh, we now are working on the Ilimbox uh, online platform where we will have all the educational resources available online from first grade to the last grade or the secondary school. And this content will be very, put together in very engaging format like TikTok format. And uh, Jenny mentioned about Balatech. We would like to host such uh, you know, plat uh, applications in, in this platform as well. And we think that uh, children who sometimes because of the pandemic have to stay, maybe girls and their traditional societies, if they can't attend school, this could be an alternative way of delivering knowledge. And, uh, uh, and finally, uh, I think one of the important uh, uh, issues related uh, uh, to our work is developing relevant content. And you can see in the next slide, this one of the pictures you can see is the textbooks that students in the capital city receive, but in the rural areas, they don't even get these kinds of books. Another case is this uh, textbook on Kyrgyz literature. If you open it, all the authors listed in these books are male authors. So you have two issues here, one availability of content and two, it's very male dominant. So we are focusing a lot on developing uh, content that is relevant and it's developed by women engineers, women teachers, and women Methodists. Uh, I think uh, that's, that's all for my part of the presentation. Back to you, Jenny. Thank you. May I also invite uh, Ms. Debbie, please, for your rec pulse recommendation. What do you have discovered during your digital mission trip in Kyrgyzstan? Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And without uh, taking much time, I will straight away come to policy recommendations and why it is needed to have more women in STEM to accelerate gender equality. Uh, most of the topics, uh, most of the points have been touched upon by earlier speakers, but I'll quickly uh, go through them. It's like, uh, we all know that women, women uh, in STEM workforce have very low representation and they also face challenges and barriers in sustaining and advancing their career. And they also experience uh, wide gender pay gaps. Uh, we have all experienced during pandemic that how it has accelerated a digital transformation. And so we can confidently say that the future of work, the future of jobs will be in technology and sciences. And therefore women need to be uh, STEM skilled so that they enter the workforce, which is created by the fourth industrial revolution. And why they need to be there? Because most of the solutions that's being designed or the algorithms of the AI are data driven. And these data are heavily or loaded with the typical gender stereotypes. It's heavily androcentric. So women need to combat these uh, biases by being there in the sector. And to do this, we need to have better policies. We need to design better policies, which, which addresses these specific issues. And uh, the policies need to be data driven. The data has to be gender segregated. And we need to start from very early years, like the foundation of gender gap that happens, gender gap in STEM happens at the early school years. So the educational institutions, uh, they can integrate topics like coding or AI or robotics into the academic curriculum so that you know the girls and young women, they learn these subjects in the school, just like any other subject. Education policies also need to be reformed so that uh, the subjects are properly integrated. And private sector has a very, very important role. Public-private partnerships, they can play an important role in imparting STEM skills, train, train the talent 
pipeline, which is technologically competent and future fit for the fourth industrial revolution. There is also need for a dedicated strategy, not only to increase the representation of women in STEM, but also see that they thrive and sustain in these high paying uh, jobs. So the organization level policy changes need to embed uh, policies like for diversity, equity, and inclusion at workplaces. And equity in, in hiring and paying wages uh, must be built into the DNA of these organizations. So I can say that now is the time to level the playing field to accelerate gender equality in STEM, and together we can do this. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for my teammates. And in the end, uh, this is just a very brief snapshot of what we've been doing now in Kyrgyzstan. Of course, there are much more other very exciting initiatives, but we wanted to end it our story and presentation with this very kind of cute, like a, a photo, which truly like touch our hearts. A small girl holding the phone with this Elim Box internet connectivity in a remote mountainous area. And she continues uh, exploring, studying, and also like the uh, finding the interest in the STEM. So we hope like this is not only one girl, there will be hundreds, thousands, even million girls can be inspired by, by our works done together. Today we presented to you such a using human-centered approach to make the systemic uh, kind of a transformation, starting from the infrastructure, digital skills training, to policy communication using both formal and informal approaches. So we are very much over, uh, open to any partnership with academic, private sector, civil society, and we are ready to continue advocating for gender equality in STEM. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, colleagues. Jenny. indeed, the role of digital technology for gender equality in STEM is very impactful and critical for expanding the opportunities of all girls and women, also in remote areas, because we are guided by one of the core SDGs principles, leaving no one behind. Uh, as we have no questions for this part, I suggest we look into some other aspects and solutions and I welcome my colleagues from Belarus to spotlight on how education, labor markets, and behavioral patterns can impact the decision of girls and women to explore the opportunities in STEM careers. And of course, uh, our Q&A uh, box is always open for your questions. Please, from Belarus, please, colleagues from Belarus, please step in. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. Uh, I will show my screen. Just a second, and yes. So this presentation is the result of uh, the collective work, a brief uh, overview of a collective work of four expert groups: UNDP, Belarus Accelerator Lab, uh, Memicro Macro Center for uh, of Belarusian State Economic University, UNDP Belarus, uh, Behavioral Insights Group, and uh, Minsk Regional Institute for Development of Education. And on this slide, you can see uh, the team leaders and their contact details. On our uh, learning journey of the gender gap in STEM, we raised the question of when it initially appears. The results of the study of national statistics showed that in college, 66% of boys uh, choose STEM specialties for further education and only 26% of girls do the same. At the university, 41% of boys choose specializations there uh, and only 21% of girls. Uh, this not only shows the scale of the problem of gender disbalance on STEM, STEM in Belarus, but also indicates that this problem already exists when choosing uh, education after school. So the turning point uh, where the reasons for the gender gap in STEM are formed is the period of making decision about choosing a specialty for further education. Uh, regardless of which path a girl is choosing, uh, go to college or go to university, uh, girls make the decision about choosing a first specialty at the age of 13 to 16. Focus groups and in-depth interviews showed that girls make this decision under the influence of a large number of factors which needs a deeper exploring. But as of now, two most recurring 
our access to STEM infrastructure, uh, which is formed under uh, urban rural uh, difference and the parents' influence, which is formed under gender stereotypes and gender balance uh, or imbalance in uh, uh, possible learning groups where a girl uh, will be learning. Uh, as a, uh, one of the uh, possible uh, interventions or uh, pilot projects that can tackle the problem of uh, uh, uneven access to uh, uh, special means of education, uh, Minsk Regional Institute for the Development of Education, jointly with High Tech Park, is developing a mobile STEM class. So the equipment is transported to the regional school, and uh, during the session, uh, a supervisor uh, tries to find uh, which kind of topics can be uh, uh, studied there with, with children. And after that, uh, on this topic, uh, there are three days and three trainings. Uh, after which uh, a rural teacher provides uh, education for rural girls, uh, girls and boys using uh, their transported equipment. And so this initiative uh, is already deployed in 17 uh, schools of nine districts of Minsk region since uh, 2017. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this initiative showed that uh, the interest from uh, parents of uh, of girls and the girls themselves is not too high. And that's why the UNDP in support of this uh, initiative uh, tries to uh, find uh, an, an, an answer how to uh, increase girls' participation in STEM. Uh, Center Micro Macro uh, have compiled a survey and we are now in the designing and intervention stage and we have uh, a certain uh, intermediate results. So the intermediate results uh, of the survey shows that uh, two main reasons why girls uh, don't choose STEM is the difficulties uh, uh, that lack of interest in this field and the complexity of the required technical knowledge. Uh, initially, uh, it was assumed that self-distrust is, is the most important factor uh, but the results of the survey shows that uh, there are two more uh, important factors. As soon as uh, these uh, factors is uh, influencing on girls uh, since childhood, we can see that uh, combination of this factor can also uh, pop out uh, during the uh, choosing STEM career uh, for women on the labor market. And with this, I would like to pass the floor to my colleague, uh, Margarita Zmachinska. Thank you. Thank you, Piotr. Uh, dear participants, it's a pleasure to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Margarita Zmachinska. I'm a thematic coordinator on human development and gender equality. I will speak today about the project that UNDP launched in Belarus to explore behavioral insights as a tool to nudge women uh, to break barriers installed by gender stereotypes and social norms and increase their participation in the economy, including in the STEM sector. As we know, gender stereotypes ingrained from a young age could reduce the likelihood that women apply to jobs in STEM. And even if women do apply, gender stereotypes negatively affect their performance during the recruitment process and at work. Sense of belonging is really important. Uh, during the recruitment process, candidates assess how likely it is that they will fit in the organization. And if they think that they are likely to be isolated as a woman in a man-dominated technical sector in Belarus, this can impact their likelihood of seeking to progress in visible workplaces. Women may also underperform at work or during recruitment processes for STEM jobs because they face what is called the stereotype threat. It occurs when someone is reminded of negative stereotypes about their group. For example, when women are reminded of the stereotypes that they are bad at math and are not suited for technical roles. When this negative stereotype is highlighted, people become anxious about fulfilling this negative stereotype, and this can impair their performance. 
So we devised four behavioral solutions that can help women to overcome those barriers. Letters from identifiable role models might increase the sense of belonging and encourage young women to apply to technical roles. For instance, women working or studying in STEM sector might send letters to young women of skill age in Belarus who are deciding what subjects or degrees to pursue. One way to counter a stereotype threat is to ask people to think about and express what they value. This is called the value affirmation. Value affirmation exercises are successful because asking people to reaffirm their values increases their sense of self-worth, which in turn could help to protect them from the stereotype threat. Another solution is to build on existing programs. Uh, in Belarus, various NGOs and tech companies run programs to support the development of technical skills. And these programs are promising touch points through which to encourage women to engage in STEM subjects. Next slide, please. At the second stage of the project, Indipin Belarus worked together with the behavioral insights team and the IT company Inform Systems to increase the representation of women in technical training courses as an open educational platform. We conducted two behavioral trials. As you can see on the slide, we uh, worked with women with existing technical skills to encourage them to continue learning. And we worked with women without any technical skills to encourage them to start studies. We delivered messages to them reaffirming their skills, highlighting flexibility of courses and highlighting that Beginner online courses are suitable for people with no prior technical knowledge. Key findings from the trial was that the most successful behavioral intervention was in affirming women's existing skills, personalizing messages to their skill level, and providing feedback about individual abilities. This intervention increased the chance that women will show interest in a technical course by more than 12%. This approach can be, of course, scaled up. For example, targeting high performing women in technical university courses with personalized invitations to apply to roles in the STEM sector. Uh, overall, this project has shown the potential that the behavioral insights can offer to reduce gender gap in STEM in Belarus and the opportunities to scale these results beyond. Thank you. So, but now uh, I'd like to pass the floor to Alexei once again. Thank you. Alexei, you have muted. Sorry, colleagues, my mic was off. Uh, definitely uh, the interventions at all stages of education and career plans help close the gender gap in STEM. And as I see no more, new questions in our Q&A box. I think we can move on with Azerbaijan. Mentorship is another solution for supporting aspirations of girls and women in STEM. And I invite colleagues from Azerbaijan to elaborate more on their mentorship program experience. And uh, as always, your questions are very, very welcome. Hello, colleagues. Uh, thank you, uh, Alexei, for introduction. And uh, yes, uh, we would like to share some uh, findings and the results, uh, maybe midterm results from our mentorship program. But before this, I would like to share our presentation or just a second. Can you help me with sharing it? It seems that I can't do that. Yes. Uh, okay, now it's good. Just a second. So, um, I think now you will be able to see it. Yes. 
Okay, great. So, uh, uh, mentorship as a tool to increase women representation in STEM, uh, we strongly believe um, into this uh, concept and we um, actually managed uh, to test it in different um, modalities, let's say, uh, starting uh, last year. But before I uh, move just to particular to mentorship part, I would like to elaborate a little bit on our on the situation as a country and the, on the whole uh, on the whole uh, project. So basically, uh, that was uh, the uh, mentorship platform is a part of Women in STEM uh, project, uh, which is basically public awareness and advocacy program uh, that UNZP implements together with USAID in Azerbaijan. Um, problem statement is quite uh, similar to what uh, we heard today and to what you all know. Uh, we have only 30% of uh, women uh, in STEM fields, and um, this is uh, this um, figure is kind of uh, stable uh, currently. It was uh, higher in the uh, Soviet period, and then it went, uh, it started to decrease, and now with all this. Uh, efforts uh, sometimes it goes uh, it goes up and then down and it very much depends on the level of, uh, uh, of on the level of uh, we are talking about usually so at the uh, level of uh, our research and analysis of the data available demonstrates that women actually girls are um, de demonstrating even better results um, than boys at the entry level uh, and uh, they get uh, they uh, get higher uh, points during the um, entry exams to the universities, uh, but then the number of girls uh, represented uh, starts to decline. Uh, this is um, this is uh, this could be explained uh, by uh, general uh, conditions which we have. Uh, all over the world and also some uh, cultural uh, of course cultural factor in Azerbaijan as well um, usually when we uh, women uh, get uh, cre create families uh, they, um, uh, they prefer to uh, change their priorities let's say and um, so uh, we uh, and also there is another thing um, for instance it's uh, also um, actual both for private sector and uh, public sector, uh, women uh, are represented uh, on the entry level positions, but the higher we uh, move, of course, the less uh, women we see. Uh, so uh, when we were uh, thinking about this pro problem and uh, on the uh, possible solutions, uh, for this uh, issue, uh, we decided that mentorship could be a very good uh, solution uh, for us specifically in Azerbaijan, because uh, there are some, um, again, uh, cultural specifics, like uh, here people uh, prefer to uh, develop uh, interpersonal connections rather than, um, like, for example, approach someone they don't know proactively. So there is need, there is a need for some push. And also, um, and yes, so, uh, and uh, following this, uh, we decided to focus on two factors for, on two, in two directions. First is to uh, raise public awareness in general about the challenges of uh, women in STEM, because there are lots of stereotypes and prejudices uh, and parents are, uh, basically decision makers. And that's why it's important to uh, approach, uh, to inform, um, to help parents you know, make informal, de informed decisions on uh, the future of their kids. So uh, with raising awareness, we decided to cover parents as an audience. Uh, we we uh, plan to create a platform to start a dialogue with key players. And uh, that's how we created uh, the series of uh, regular webinars. Uh, inviting uh, public sector, private sector, academia, almost everyone, and um, to inspire and support women in STEM in general and to develop a portfolio of experiments and find out best working modalities. And there, this is where we started our experiments with uh, mentorship and we still continue uh, them. 
So uh, we, uh, in, in, in raising awareness, we had, um, we, we, we used different approaches. Uh, we produced uh, some um, videos. Uh, you can see some um, screenshots from here. We uh, produced uh, animations of this kind. Some infographics with uh, key uh, key numbers saying that, uh, for example, this one that uh, uh, girls um, applying to universities uh, ha have even uh, better results than uh, boys. Uh, also, uh, we uh, were quite successful in promoting our program actually at all the, all levels, so that. Um, uh, it became uh, very visible to uh, top uh, high rank officials. And our program was the one uh, covered during the uh, speech of uh, the first lady at the ISESCA conference um, on uh, girls in STEM uh, in February. So uh, we really made this, uh, what uh, our main finding is to, uh, in this, um, part of this um, program is a very simplified and easy to comprehend uh, communication. So uh, with all hashtags and all communication, all uh, friendly uh, user-friendly videos, we managed to reach uh, many, many people at different levels and to make the problem very uh, clear and understandable, sorry. Mm. As for starting the dialogue, uh, yes, we started it in the period of pan pandemic. That was a little bit tough, but uh, we managed to have um, six webinars so far uh, covering different topics like uh, ecosystem, uh, mentors and mentorship, education, um, jobs, uh, STEM jobs for uh, women, um, legislation behind, and etc. So uh, basically, our webinars uh, were designed in the way where we um, were exploring the topic, uh, basically, uh, not just uh, trying to find actual solutions, but more trying to match uh, the problems, match and map the problems and uh, agencies responsible for um, solving this potential uh, problems and closing these gaps. Why? Because we are just in the beginning of this um, uh, road and uh, we need to, uh, to understand better uh, the, the the surface and, and the situation and to make this horizon scanning, let's say. Uh, for mentorship uh, platform, again, we followed our principle like the uh, with the simplification and um, we uh, just used uh, a ready, uh, uh, ready platform for mentorship. This is one of the one just one of the startups made this platform available. It's specifically designed for mentorship program. It can be used by anyone. This is a mentorship platform. And we created a, a, there a platform where we matched uh, mentors and mentees uh, in a very simple way, connecting them through the platform. Uh, we match them manually, making made our decision uh, based on the background of mentors and mentees. And so far, we have around 25, uh, uh, 25 uh, peers, and sometimes it, uh, this number decreases uh, or increases, but uh, overall, this is like what we have now. So the whole idea of our mentorship program is to have uh, individual, individually connected uh, mentor and mentee. Uh, these people uh, set their own KPIs. Uh, also, we have kind, some kind of structure, but we gave some uh, freedom uh, to, to, to both mentees and mentees because we wanted to test different, um, different modalities. So, so far, the most successful modality is when a uh, mentor and mentee define KPIs uh, specific to them and then uh, to specific to the needs of mentee. And then we just follow through, uh, through the process. Uh, our team monitors the number of meetings uh, during the week and uh, uh, and uh, basically uh, that's it. And, and, and of course, there is some, and the results. So uh, when we announced uh, when we in announced uh, this uh, project, uh, we got uh, we had some uh, successes and uh, issues and challenges. Let's say uh, the first challenge is uh, getting uh, in 
mentors and we still experience this challenge. Uh, we have um, mentors uh, even uh, beyond Azerbaijan. We had to invite mentors from other countries because it was not enough. Uh, we don't have um, people uh, available on the high level positions, uh, females, uh, ready to spend uh, enough time. Plus, this culture is quite new. So we have to uh, promote the mentorship culture culture before uh, recruiting mentors, not uh, mentioning that we had to train them, but um, this is also an, uh, a challenge. And we had received more than 150 applications just with a couple posts on Facebook, which on our page, which clearly demonstrates the uh, need of the, pro uh, of, the uh, uh, of the mentorship. Uh, so far, uh, we had uh, uh, we uh, observed uh, uh, we, we we let the peers work together for six months. We switched uh, mentors uh, once uh, after first three months, uh, and uh, so far we see the big progress in uh, many different areas. Those uh, mentees who needed uh, soft skills development, they worked on this. Some people uh, progressed in career, uh, getting new positions. Uh, some others uh, managed to get new internship. Uh, um, some of them uh, started new projects and etc. and so on. And uh, basically this is uh, incredible results. Uh, almost all peers have these results, which clearly demonstrates uh, the success of the project. And uh, we plan to continue. Uh, first, we plan to continue with webinars. We plan to uh, keep promoting the mentorship platform because we believe that this individual approach is important, uh, considering the culture in uh, 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 culture of uh, in Azerbaijan. Leila, excuse uh, me, please, but we are running out of time, and if you can uh, wrap it up, it will be yes. Uh, okay, uh, we started happen. actually. Yes, we started just like I'm two minutes beyond, uh, but I will finalize now. So uh, we uh, plan to engage with new partners and we uh, plan to upgrade our mentorship platform, introducing new uh, uh, new models, because we found out that some modules could be uh, all the same as soft skills and uh, some general topics. And of course, we plan to grow new mentors. Uh, so that's it. And we are looking forward. Uh, in case of any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to write it now or approach me separately. Thank you. Thank you, Leila, for this very great presentation. Uh, definitely programs like the one you have just presented truly encourages and motivates girls and women to succeed in STEM education and inspires them to look forward towards career development in this area. Uh, so we go to Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan has a significant positive experience in promoting gender equality in STEM. And the next speakers are welcome to share their thoughts on what else should be done to foster and amplify this experience across the country and the region. Colleagues, you are very welcome. Hi everyone, um, Alexi. Just sorry, zooming myself. Just to confirm. Okay, okay. And I will share my screen, I guess. Oops. Yeah, there we go. Just a second. Okay. Uh, so, hi everyone, please let me know if you, if you can see the screen. Uh, on my side, my name is uh, Alena Tkachenko and I'm the founder of Study CS uh, Foundation. That's a non-commercial entity uh, with the aim to improve computer science and digital literacy in Kazakhstan and make our girls and boys as well uh, be globally competitive. Uh, right now, I'd like to talk about uh, the role of ICT classes uh, in specifically forming the perception uh, of STEM, uh, STEM roles and STEM jobs uh, for girls and how it influences them. So to, 
to share our insights, uh, I, I will need to say that it is all based on the study that we have done recently. And uh, even though there are a few things that are intersecting with uh, what the previous speakers uh, just told, I think there are a few points that will be specifically interesting for uh, everyone here. So on the study itself, uh, we've done it in February, April this year. Uh, it was a national wide research and uh, the format was uh, quantitative and also desk research. Uh, plenty of people participated. We, we've got about 19,000 people and half of them were school kids, half are um, the parents uh, for the younger kids. Our objective were to understand like what's the level of satisfaction with uh, ICT lessons that uh, we have at schools, plus uh, also um, measure the level of digital literacy um, amongst school students, as well as evaluate the role of ICT lessons in promoting digital literacy across uh, kids. So uh, a few numbers just to show you and to give you a perspective of what Kazakhstan looks like. Uh, in terms of schools, we have 7,000 schools in the country. We have around 3.3 million uh, schools, school kids studying at schools. Uh, for us, um, ICT lessons start at first grade. Uh, this will be the case for January next year. Right now, it really depends on the schools. Uh, we have some schools studying uh, ICT from the third grade, some from the first grade, but that's the general practice. And the interesting point is that 65% of students and parents are actually happy with uh, what they have at ICT lesson. And talking about ICT lesson specifically, uh, both parents and students, again, do not perceive it like something important. So let's say math, mathematics is important, physics is important. ICT lesson is something that you can skip or even change for extra mathematics or physics lesson. So what were the findings that we had? And how do they apply to women and girls uh, and STEM specifically? Uh, I will need to say that half of the respondents uh, among kids were women, like young girls. And uh, for the teachers, uh, 70 plus percent from the teachers that we uh, talked to were also women. So there is a big portion uh, in the findings that applies to women. So first finding that we had was that every fifth school student actually perceives computer science as programming. So what it means uh, for us, I think, is that uh, this is a major limiting factor that uh, limits the perception and the interest in uh, STEM and computer science area. Uh, before Dr. Julia Lee talked about uh, stereotypes and talked about rebranding of the um, STEM and computer science concept. And I think that uh, rebranding is uh, one of the major uh, things to do, but the other thing to do is also to somehow broaden of, or, or broaden the meaning of what STEM and what computer science is. It's not just coding. It's also, it, it can be applied to fashion, it can be applied to biology, it can be applied to somewhere else. It's a daily life story. So this is why um, I think many girls can initially get interested in STEM and we should really focus on this. Second topic is that uh, students are actually unaware of their knowledge gaps. Uh, what it means is that everyone is happy with the lessons. Everyone is happy that the lesson is not, I, I see the lesson I mean is not really tough. Uh, and kids as well as their parents do not understand what they don't understand and don't know. So it means that actually they don't feel the urge to, um, to study more. And in this sense, we need to know that there is this imbalance 
and we need to proactively deliver the content to the uh, to the students because they're not going to look for that. Uh, and we see like based on the global exams that, for example, like Kazakhstan scores really low, despite everyone being very happy with their lessons. Third point is that uh, we don't have any dedicated government program for digital literacy and digital literacy is something that is not included in the ICT lessons, meaning that we need to have a lot of uh, private sector inputs in this area. Uh, if we want girls to know, uh, to have digital literacy skills, which means at least for me, uh, that you need to be able to distinguish uh, in between true and false information. Uh, you need to understand that it's not secure to send your bank credit uh, credit card details to someone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We need to actively involve private sector there. So those are three core things. First, uh, broaden the perception. Second. Um, be proactive in terms of content delivery because they don't know what they don't know. Third, um, add private companies to the play to the game. Uh, in terms of what we do is uh, that's a brief snapshot from our action plan. I'm going just to focus on the girls part, uh, even though we, we have a major focus on the rural areas as well. So in terms of the girls, uh, I, I would say that uh, we want to really promote available program for, uh, for the girls. And in many cases, uh, not everyone is aware of what's, what's there. Uh, for example, on my side, like on my personal side, I didn't go abroad to study, not because I, I was too stupid to go, but because I didn't know that there is an option. I just had a very limited number of options in my mind when I applied to university. Uh, we want to promote girls uh, in CES area, in STEM areas uh, that we have in Kazakhstan, and we want to promote them both in Kazakhstan via media sources as well as abroad. And we want to uh, focus on the digital literacy content creation because we don't see a lot of stuff being out there in Kazakhstan. Uh, in terms of our... Um, Interest areas, I would say that we are always open to share country-specific expertise on STEM that we have. Uh, girls in STEM, ICT at school, that's are all our areas of interest. Uh, we're open to collaborate and we are also open to work on the technical solutions because we don't only focus on the research side and kind of like soft uh, side, but we also have uh, technical engineers in the team who have the development uh, capacity. That's it. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Alona, and of course, Aina, um, for your important work that you're doing in promoting digital education in um, Kazakhstan. So my name is Aizhan. Um, I'm uh, representing NDB Kazakhstan Accelerator Lab. And now actually I have more of announcements rather than a big presentation and especially after uh, a long day and uh, following up with actually what Tara mentioned earlier. Why are we even having this conversation about women in STEM? and uh, how can we link it to actual global problems and real problems uh, that people are uh, facing globally. So how can technology help address, in this case, an alarming problem of gender-based violence in Central Asia? So uh, why is it even important to have more women in STEM? And I'm sure you already know the answer. Uh, and I saw so many people who already um, do amazing initiative in their own country. So we and all of you already have valuable skills and ideas to solve the problems that we're facing today. So our job as an accelerator lab at UNDP Kazakhstan, together with the regional spotlight program is to tap into the knowledge of women and men in STEM for greater good. So I'm here today to announce that we are organizing an online hackathon for university students and recent graduates across five Central Asian countries. 
and they are Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. And we want to see all of you and more young women and young men in STEM, and not only in STEM degrees, to join our event. So if you're a current student or you just recently graduated, um, if you work at university or know who do, who do and uh, if you simply care about the issue and want to contrib contribute, reach out to me and you can see the email uh, in the bottom right um, side of the slide and uh, I'll definitely get back to you. So we're looking for activists who can be our ambassadors across Central Asia to engage as many students in the hackathon as possible. So if you're interested, send me a note. And to give a bit more details about this um, hackathon that I'm talking about, let me just uh, give you three challenges that we have. So first, how to use data and technology to reach those who experience violence. We know about the widespread culture of shame, which often places blame on women. And because of this, we don't even know the true scale of the issue and uh, who suffer from this even among our friends and family. And uh, second challenge is how to eliminate the stigma around the issue. How can we help our own societies to talk more openly about violence against women and what can we even do about it? And finally, the third challenge we'll focus during our hackathon is actual technological solutions. So what uh, applications or portals or whatever else can be created that will prevent gender-based violence on university campuses specifically. So let's focus on action. After um, hearing about the research, after knowing about the problem, uh, after understanding the complex issue uh, we're discussing here today, let's focus on action. Let's take part in this hackathon. And I'm very excited because I'm sure it will result in um, actionable solutions in the uh, real um, projects that we can all utilize together and make our society safer for girls and women. And uh, thank you so much for organizers. And that's it from my side. Again, my email is on the bottom um, right. <laughs> so you can uh, make a note of that, have a, get a screenshot and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Aleona Ejan, very much indeed. Definitely amazing cases, very solid progress, but still a lot of work ahead for sure. Uh, dear participants, colleagues, thanks for staying with us. And we have the last but not the least important exercise for your attention. It is called Action Tree. And I strongly en encourage you to participate in this exercise. Jenny and Victoria, please, I'm giving the floor to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for all the audience. Because having a conference more than two hours, we still have over 100 participants. This is a record. So all of you, you are amazing. Even though we only like uh, invited a couple of like role models, gender champions, but I truly want you to say like all of you here, audience, you are gender champions yourself because you are so much passionate about building this equitable future together with us and staying with us here. So last but not the least, this is the last uh, exercise before the closing remark. Please give us 10 minutes. Uh, let's finish one very interesting exercise. I would like to introduce also um, uh, my colleague, uh, Victoria. Yeah, hello to everyone. Really nice to see everyone here. Great conference and event. Uh, my name is Vika and I also work for Accelerator Lab in the Kyrgyz Republic. And here with Jenny, we would like to introduce like an interactive exercise to all of you. Доброго времени суток всем. Меня зовут Вика. Я также работаю в акселератор лаборатории ПРО ООН в Кыргызской Республике. И вместе с Дженни мы бы хотели пригласить вас поучаствовать в небольшом интерактивном упражнении, поскольку данная конференция – это только начало, starting point для всех нас. И мы надеемся, что с помощью этого упражнения мы сможем собрать больше контактов и понять, какие именно сферы интересны для нас всех. Что ж, Дженни, actually, what is the action tree? Could you please tell us more about that? Right. You see, Vika, today we have so many speakers from different parts of the world, bring this different kind of perspective. We have researchers, people doing the programs, people doing the communication. And I've been also observing in the chat, there are so many requests. People are asking like, hey, uh, uh, is there anything for the media campaign? 
Well, some people said, I also wanted to contribute for this kind of STEM, uh, STEM for all. So why don't we gather everybody in this kind of Moodle board? This is a very kind of interesting digital board. So you can simply put on your kind of name and sticker to on this. So uh, I would like, yes, thank you, Vika. So my colleague Vika is showing now the screen. Before going to the board, let us make a demo, okay? What does that look like? So this is a tree, but based on the actions. And you, you see here, there are a couple of kind of circle. It means the field of the interest. For example, let's say, yes, Vika, maybe I can give it to you and then we can continue. Да, Дженни, действительно, сегодня было очень много участников и есть, и я думаю, это уникальная возможность для всех нас понять, какие именно сферы сотрудничества всем нам интересны. Это могут быть очень разные филды, сферы, как вы видите, и думаю, будет здорово, если все мы поделимся нашими контактами и идеями, если они у вас уже есть. Для этого я надеюсь, что многие из вас уже пользовались Mural Board. Если нет, то я кратко объясню, как это можно сделать. Мы просим вас использовать стикеры, которые расположены с левой стороны. Вы можете переносить их, используя ваш курсор. На стикере мы просим уточнить свои данные, а именно это ваше имя. И если вам комфортно, вы также можете указать сразу свой email и краткую идею для сотрудничества. Дженни? Yes, just in English to explain. So this is a Moodle board for some people who are first time using it. You go to the link and you see there's a left hand side, a lot of stickers. So what that mean? Based on the circle, let's say, for example, like I'm, I want to do some communication campaign. So you can put your name with a, uh, with a sticker on that in, inside of the circle. You simply need to indicate your name, uh, or if you prefer, you can share your organization, what kind of idea you want to stay with us. Uh, if you want to place as an email, that will be great, but if no, don't worry. We do have all your registration list uh, in our Zoom. So please indicate the name exactly as the one you registered the Zoom so that we can follow up with you. So by saying this, this is not the end of the conference. We'll still do a lot of follow-up exercise if you leave your contacts there. Да, именно так. Мы просим указать вас то имя, которое вы указывали при регистрации на данную конференцию. Если вы пользуетесь сейчас мобильным устройством и вам не очень удобно пользоваться Mural Board, пожалуйста, оставляйте свои контакты также в чате нашей конференции. К примеру, yeah, первый fine. филд... So even though you feel not comfortable with using Moodle or you're in the mobile, so you can still leave your comment in your chat. We have our colleagues, we'll put this like onto this uh, uh, action tree. Vika, why don't we just uh, like, while people so busy, I see so many stickers going around, just go uh, one by one. Let's say about the communication. How do you understand this, Vika? Uh, да, к примеру, про коммуникации. Если вам интересно сторителлинг, uh, или вы готовы рассказывать или вести блоги о uh, девушках в STEM, либо вы сами являетесь uh, такой девушкой и хотите рассказать свою историю, пожалуйста, оставляйте свой стикер на uh, circle, который называется communication, коммуникации. Uh, если же вы, и вам интересны исследования, касающиеся STEM, uh, к примеру, мне, как uh, руководителю по исследованию, в акселератор лаборатории очень интересно понимать какие есть разрывы в данных верно ли данные отражают положение девушек в стем как мы можем с разных сторон подойти к этой проблеме какие у нас есть пропуски или недостатки в экосистеме которые возможно не позволяют большему количеству девушек участвовать в стем и раскрывать свои возможности в этом случае оставляйте свои данные в круге который называется research исследования Дженни? Yes. So, for example, communication after the conference, we will kick off the storytelling campaign. So if you know someone or if you want your story to be shared at the Stand for All regional platform and UNDP, you can definitely put your stickers there. Are you a blogger? 
are you a video vlogger or you want to uh, participate in the podcast or any kind of interesting communication campaigns to raise awareness, please do that. Of course, we also have this research. For example, today, so many speakers share their research, right? Um, do you have the plan or you have completed very interesting research? Do leave their, uh, 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 your contacts there. And I would love to, for example, I also see there's a program and project activity. What's that mean? Uh, today, a couple of UNDP country office, they have already presented their kind of project activity. It's just something they're already working on. And if you have any plan or you, if you would like to collaborate with them, so do indicate in the project activities. Да, к примеру, другой потенциальной сферой для коллаборации является проектная и программная деятельность. Сегодня на конференции участвовали country офисы, страновые офисы программ про ООН, и почти что в каждом офисе есть проекты, которые посвящены именно теме STEM. Если вы хотите сотрудничать с данными проектами, оставляйте свои контакты в круге, который называется Project Activities или же проекты и мероприятия. Если у вас есть идеи для таких проектов, или же вы уже осуществляете подобные проекты, пожалуйста, оставляйте свои идеи именно в этой области. That's great. Hey, Avika, do you see this opportunity for girls? Could you please elaborate? Да, um, возможности для девушек – это еще один circle или круг, где мы ожидаем от вас контактные данные. Um, я думаю, каждый из нас понимает, насколько важно иногда иметь в жизни ментора, учителя и наставника, который может поделиться своим опытом, своими знаниями. Я думаю, что лично в моей жизни такой опыт имел место быть, и действительно я научилась многому благодаря этому опыту. Если вы готовы стать ментором, либо наоборот вы ищете такую поддержку, либо вы знаете о каких-то классных программах для девушек, это могут быть и практики в частных компаниях, это могут быть стажировки или другие возможности, делитесь ими, и мы обязательно затем поделимся со всеми после конференции. Opportunity for girls, we mean, for example, our Leila today presented very successful experience in Azerbaijan. How they're using this mentorship, right? So do you have any resources or interesting to collaborate to become a mentor? Or do you have any idea like, oh, I have this kind of volunteering opportunities for girls, internship opportunity for girls. Also like those kind of private company. Yes, you do. You can still also sponsor or to help with the fundraising to provide more opportunity for girls. Of course, this is just a very main field of the um, uh, kind of interest for collaboration. We do have our other. So if there's any field is not mentioned here, you can still put it on other. So Vika, you know what we're going to do? I see it's so busy on the moral board and still keep coming. There's a lot of email like in the chat. When you put it in the chat, please indicate the field of interest because there's so many people of you over 100. So we need to somehow to manage after the conference according to each different circle and we will follow up you accordingly. Да, если у вас есть еще какие-то идеи, которые не подпадают под четыре обозначенных области – коммуникации, исследования, возможности для девушек, проекты и мероприятия, то оставляйте свои контактные данные в круге, который обозначен uh, «other» – «другие». Uh, вы также можете оставить свой email, uh, имя и идею в чате. Uh, и, пожалуйста, uh, оставляйте uh, конкретную сферу, по которой вы хотели бы сотрудничать, поскольку после конференции с вами свяжутся именно на основе конкретной сферы, uh, чтобы сделать uh, коллаборацию более успешной. That's so awesome. Thank you. You know, uh, participants, this moral board will be open until the next Monday. So take your time, think over. Maybe you'll find some potential partners or the same minded people like you are here in the circles. So that's also great. So in the sake of the time, let's go back to our kind of main hall with our moderator, Alexei. Uh, thanks for giving us this opportunity to facilitate this action tree, which is truly the action-based learning network. Thank you, Alexei, pass it over to you. Thank you, Jenny and Victoria, very much. It's very exciting, practical, engaging, and very useful exercise. And I think we had a lot of fun, but at the same time, we learned lots of 
useful things. Coming to the end of the conference, I invite you to stay in contact with us, share your experience and knowledge, continue advocating for STEM and gender equality throughout our follow-up initiatives and upcoming storytelling campaign. The conference, of course, will be available in recording, and we will organize all the presentations at the STEM for All website, where you can go and download them. Thank you all for very interesting, pragmatic, and open dialogue on such an important issue as gender equality on STEM. And I think we did a lot of progress there, and we heard lots of success stories, lots of solutions which we can apply in different uh, country contexts and on the regional level. Finally, I want to pass the floor to Louise Chamberlain, UNDP resident representative in Kyrgyzstan for the closing remarks. Dear Louise, you are very, very welcome. Thank you so much, Alexei, and, and thanks for, uh, to all the participants for the wonderful energy that you have brought today. Uh, there is so much uh, talent in this room, and I've been really inspired by all your stories and the honesty with which you've been telling them. We've, we've crammed so much into uh, two hours and a bit. We started on uh, actually uh, looking at the future of work and what it means, and we we, we talked about the disconnect uh, between uh, the needs of the, the labor market, which is increasingly technology intensive, and uh, you know that, that women are somehow not making the cut or, or perhaps the leaky pipe, uh, you know, somehow uh, falling off uh, along the way. And, and, and why is that? Well, uh, a lot of very clear reasons were provided, but perhaps focusing especially on uh, the issues of stereotypes, the male techie, and, and uh, the need for role models, uh, such as yourselves, all of you, as has been said already, all of you, uh, men and women, uh, you are uh, really the role models for how we can build this uh, future together. Um, and and I, uh, as was also highlighted, this issue of gender, uh, gender equality in, in STEM is, is much more than just an issue of, uh, of rights or equality. It's really about uh, the, the success of societies and of, of economies. So uh, in that sense, we can think of increasing gender equality as being a solution to a, a market problem. So uh, thank you all for your wonderful examples, uh, country examples, grassroots examples. They're all absolutely uh, wonderful. Um, and uh, going forward, um, I think uh, one of the, the challenges is also how do we connect, you know, how do we come together in, in this complex agenda and what's the most important thing. I think one of the, the my favorite parts today actually was to see the action tree and the connection tree and the eagerness of all of you to, to learn from each other and to remain connected. So that's also where we want uh, from UNDP side to, to leave off is that Let's, uh, let's make sure that we bring this network uh, alive across the region. Uh, let's continue into to bringing the action tree. Uh, let's keep on watering the tree. <laughs> and uh, let's also keep uh, the, the storytelling campaign is kicking off uh, from the UNDP STEM for All and Accelerator Lab networks. And so we'll be able to hear and, and share more stories from, from gender champions there. And, and, and looking forward also to highlight this, uh, uh, in, including a, a campaign that's devoted to the International Day of the Girl Child. And uh, uh, for me also, what was a really important recognition is this, the different phases that we have to tackle. It, it's starting from a very early age, right? Where we need to address uh, uh, STEM uh, in, in education and then and also going up. And, and for me, one, one, one point that really resonated was the, the, the work of, of technovation in, in you know, working not just with the, the, the girls and the children, but actually with whole families and, and for kids to watch their parents learn. I, I, I can tell you as, a, as, as an older person in this, uh, uh, I could certainly benefit from some learning. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask my kids to, to, to bring me along to something. So, so I think this is the, the end. I want to thank all the wonderful colleagues in the region who, who are behind this event. Uh, your passion is, is contagious. And I think we have been further inspired by all the wonderful participants and, and the, the lovely, lovely stories that uh, also can be replicated. Let's, let's do much more together. Let's stay connected and let's make the action happen 
it's your, your, your passion and your drive that's going to make this successful in our region. So uh, I'll end there and just say thanks, thanks again for a wonderful two hours. I really appreciated this. I believe that means that the meeting is actually closed, right? <laughs> yes. So Alexei, uh, thank you so much for, for moderating. Thank you, Luis, for your closing remark. We still have over 70 people. Thanks for leaving all your contacts. Now we are just saying bye, but this is not official bye. We'll stay, uh, we're gonna stay connected with you and follow up this more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Have a great Bye. weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.